Okay, if you want to grab your Bibles and go to the book of 2 Corinthians, we almost finished chapter 2 last week and uh, uh, got caught and uh, we're not able to get there and so we're going to look at the last few verses of chapter 2 this morning and we do need to make some progress uh, in our study today if we're ever going to try to finish the book. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. When you read the book of 2 Corinthians, a large part of it um, is, is Paul having to deal with some, some false teachers who had come into the church in Corinth, and because of their presence and because of uh, their particular teachings, they had really caused some problems in the church there. Particularly, they had uh, brought about some issues among the brethren of, uh, they were trying to discredit Paul. They were trying to destroy the brethren's trust in Paul himself and therefore in his teachings. And so Paul has to spend a great deal of time in this book of 2 Corinthians uh, discounting uh, their efforts of these false teachers, uh, continuing, to, uh, continuing to establish and to confirm his apostleship. But as we've said each week, not for his own good, but for the benefit of his uh, for his teachings. If they were going to discredit Paul's apostleship, then, then you can't believe anything Paul says. And Paul is more concerned about them believing what he says than they are them believing uh, uh, anything about him personally. Uh, but he has dealt with and will continue to deal with and what we look at today, uh, this matter of uh, different accusations that were brought against him uh, for, uh, uh, for his actions and all sorts of things called into question. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, where Paul has one of these moments in this book where he is filled with joy and, uh, and with excitement. 2 Corinthians 2, verse 14, he says, Now thanks be to God, who always leads us, not just sometimes, He always leads us in triumph, not just anywhere, but He leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us, here we are as Christians, Little old Christians, but through us, God diffuses or He manifests or He spreads the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. As Christians, we are the, uh, uh, as Jesus would say in Matthew 5, we're the light of the world. We're supposed to let our light shine. It's a different metaphor used here instead of a light. Uh, we are fragrance that is to be spread, and uh, it has different reactions. It is uh, to those, verse 16, to the one, those who, uh, who are perishing, we are the aroma of death leading to death. But to those who are being saved, we are the aroma of life leading to life. The gospel has a different impact on different people. Uh, sometimes the gospel will have a, a pleasant impact and, be, and will be received, and therefore the people will be saved. But sometimes it's rejected, and so it has a, uh, a negative uh, uh, reaction. But that's just the impact that the gospel has. Is it based upon the power of the gospel, or is it based upon the heart of the, re the recipient? It's based upon the heart, isn't it? The re the, the uh, the reception of the gospel is not based upon the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel doesn't change. So whether, uh, whether the gospel is presented as an as a, uh, aroma of death or an aroma of life is based upon the person who is receiving it. And here's where we stopped last week in the last question of verse 16. And we're going to pick up here and uh, try to answer this question and get into chapter 3. Paul says at the end of chapter 2 and verse 16, And who is sufficient... For these things. Anybody have a different word than the word sufficient? Adequate. Paul has just spent verses 14, 15, and 16 talking about how great it is to be a Christian. And he's been talking about the wonderful privilege that Christians have of sharing the gospel. And the fact that he says in verse 14 that through us we are able to triumph through Christ because through us God's spreading the word. And he gets to verse 16 and he says, Who are we to be able to have that privilege? 
who are, why, who are we to be adequate for this? How are we even sufficient to fulfill such a task? Look in chapter 4 and verse 7. We won't get this far today. But look in chapter 4 verse 7 where you have a similar statement where he says, But we have this treasure, the treasure of the gospel, the light of the gospel. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What does that mean? Who are the earthen vessels? We are. We are the vessels that are carrying the gospel. Why are we called earthen? Or does anybody have a different word than the word earthen? Clay? We're like clay. We're temporary. We're fragile. We're not perfect. Sometimes we're going to fall apart. Why would God put the gospel in and give it into our hands? So that we can take it to other people who are fragile. Take it to other people who are made of clay and in need of it. But Paul, come back to chapter 2, verse 16. Paul says, who's sufficient? Who in the world has, who is, who is qualified? Who is adequate enough to take the gospel? And I want you to drop down to verse, chapter 3 and look at verse 5. And we'll come back up and finish chapter 2. But you've got to drop down to chapter 3, verse 5, where Paul helps us to answer his question. Chapter 2, verse 16, he says, Who's sufficient for these things? Chapter 3, verse 5, not us. At least, he says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves. It's not us. We're, we're not qualified. We're not adequate or sufficient in and of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves. Now, the false teachers that had come into Corinth they had been making all sorts of bold claims about their own actions, about their own accomplishments, about their own abilities. Paul says in chapter 3, verse 5, it, it has nothing to do with us. It has nothing to do with the fact that we are qualified to do this. But he says at the end of verse 5, but our sufficiency, our adequacy, where does it come from? It comes from God. God is the one who has taken the gospel and his uh, as Paul would say to Timothy, he has entrusted it to us. In earthen vessels, God has entrusted the gospel to us, not because we are adequate, but because he is. Not because there's something special about us, but because there's something special about him. The sufficiency is not of ourselves, chapter 3, verse 5, but the sufficiency is from God. Look at verse 6, who also made us, Sufficient as what? Some people have the word ministers in your translation, chapter 3, verse 6. Some people might have the word servants. It is God who has made us qualified, sufficient, adequate. He is the one who has made us servants or ministers. The word there, the, the Greek word for servant or minister that you have in chapter 3, verse 6. Is the Greek word diakonos. Do you know what word, what English word we get from the Greek word diakonos? Deacons. Deacons is just a, is a more specific, specialized uh, translation of diakonos. And so if they're talking about a particular uh, work, a particular man, he might be called a deacon. What is a deacon? A deacon is a servant. A deacon is a minister. They're, those three words, they all mean the same thing. And so Paul says here that God has made us sufficient, qualified to take the gospel. He's the one who has made us diakonos, ministers of the rest of verse 6 or the rest of that statement of the new covenant. So we as Christians, we are Servants of the new covenant. We are to carry that new covenant. We are ministers of the new covenant. Um, while there are places, while there are places in the New Testament where Paul refers to himself as a minister, if the word minister simply means servant, who, who are the ministers today in the church? Everybody. You know, it's interesting that, uh, that uh, many churches uh, will call and, and uh, identify and set apart uh, 
their preachers and call them their minister. Well, there's nothing particularly wrong with that because, yes, he is the minister. But, guess what? So is everybody else in the church. We're all ministers, as the word is used in the New Testament. We are all servants. Uh, and so if, we, uh, uh, if we're going to come back and try to use Bible words in the way that the Bible uses them, uh, we are all called servants. We are all called ministers. Um, in the very same way, 1 Peter chapter 2 says that uh, which, which people in the church are the priests? All Christians are priests in 1 Peter chapter 2. And so all uh, Christians are, are the priests. They, uh, uh, they have direct access to God. All Christians are ministers of, of the gospel, the servants of the gospel to carry it to others. Uh, so come back to chapter 2, verse 17. We'll finish chapter 2 and then uh, go through chapter 3. After Paul asked in verse 16, who is sufficient for these things? He says in verse 17, for we are not, as so many are, we are not peddling the Word of God. We are not peddling the Word of God. What does that mean? Anybody have a different word than the word peddling? Say again. Corrupting. Corrupting. Anybody got anything different? Sell. Chapter 2, verse 17. We're not selling. Selling it for profit. We are not, what, what do you think of when you think of a peddler? And don't say a bicycle. What do you think of when you think of a peddler? Somebody selling something. Okay. Get more specific with me. I mean, somebody selling something. I, I, I can go to McDonald's today and there's going to be somebody selling me something uh, behind the counter. Is that person a peddler? All right, everybody said something, and I heard all of you and didn't understand a thing. What do we think of when we think of a peddler? A street vendor. What did you say, Freddie? Trying to pull a scam on you. Anybody ever been to New York City? You go to New York City, you want some of these or you want some of these, right? They, they got peddlers all over the place. They got those street vendors all over, and sometimes in our minds we think of peddlers, and they're the ones who are trying to scam you. Paul says, we're not doing that with the gospel. He's doing a couple things with this verse. One, he's saying, there are some people among you, these false teachers who have come among you, that's what they're doing. They're taking the word of God, and they're not, notice what he says in the rest of the verse. They are not using it out of sincerity. We are, but they're not. They're coming to you, and they're trying to uh, corrupt it. They're trying to sell it for a profit. Uh, it's interesting that the word here means that they are, uh, we are not peddling, we are not adulterating the word of God for gain. It's not a word you think about with the Bible very often, but the word means we're not adulterating. Is adultery a word that we think of very fondly? We're not taking that which is precious and pure and trying to use it for our own gain and twist it for our own. No, no, no. There were some who would, uh, who would come in, the, come in, uh, in the streets and they would sell you a basket of fruit. They'd sell you a basket of fruit. And guess what they'd put on the top of the basket? The good looking fruit. Guess what was underneath? Oh, well, you're not supposed to look at that. Look at this basket of fruit. Doesn't it look good? Yeah, give me 10 bucks. And you walk off. Yeah, you got three pieces of good fruit. Everything underneath it is rotten. Paul says we're not doing that with the Word of God. We're not trying to show you one part of it so that you'll listen to us, but we're trying to hide the rest of it from you. We're not adulterating the Word of God. We have brought it to you in its purity. We have brought it to you uh, in sincerity, and we have brought it to you. Look at the end of verse 17. But as of sincerity, but as from God. 
It's not from us. It's not about us. It's from God. And we speak it, the end of verse 17, in the sight of God in Christ. Paul says we are not afraid of Jesus to see what we're doing. We're not afraid of Jesus to hear what we're saying. Let Jesus go ahead and in the sight of the Lord, let Him listen to us. Let Him watch us. Let Him, let him hear what we're saying. We're not afraid of that. What about the false teachers? Should they have been afraid of what they were saying? And the, were they saying, what, were the false teachers, what they were saying, were they saying it in the sight of God? Yeah, they didn't know that. They didn't say that. They didn't think that. But everything we do and say is in the sight of God, isn't it? Paul says, we're preaching the Word of God in the sight of God, but we're not afraid because we are trying to do it uh, and not tamper with what God has given to us. Look in chapter 3. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or do we need as some others, talking about those false teachers that had come in, he says, there's some others who have come in. Do we need like those other defiled ones who have come among you? Do we need epistles or letters of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? What's he asking? These false teachers were claiming to be apostles. Um, well, if you were an apostle in the first century, had the Lord given you certain abilities, certain miraculous abilities, to prove that you were an apostle? Well, if I was going to claim to be an apostle, and I really wasn't, if I was going to claim to be an apostle and I didn't have those miraculous abilities... What if I could just come up with a, a document? What if I could come up with a certified, um, uh, stamped document that showed, looky here, this says, I am an apostle. We have a driver's license. Maybe they had an apostle license. And you just pull it, can I see your identification? Yes, absolutely. Here's my identification. It has my picture and my name, and it says I'm an apostle. Paul says, do we, need, do we need those letters? Do we need those letters of commendation to you to prove who we are? Or do we need those letters of commendation from you so that we can go and prove to somebody else who we are? Look at what he says in verse 2. What's the first word you have in verse 2? You, brethren, are our epistle. You are our epistle. Letter. We don't carry around a piece of paper. We don't carry a la around a letter with us, say, looky here, this is what it says about me. You are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by who? How did people know that Paul was really an apostle? Because he had a piece of paper? No, because of the church in Corinth or the church in Ephesus, or the church in Philippi, or, or any other number of churches, uh, congregations that he had established. Uh, back in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 2, he had talked about the fact that the church there was his, the seal of his apostleship. Paul says, you all are the proof. You're the proof that I'm an apostle. You saw the miracles. You heard the word preached. You were the ones who were converted. And by your conversion, you proved. You proved that I was an apostle. So he says, if you're going to go around claiming that I'm not an apostle, <laughs> you're putting yourselves on trial. And, and you're condemning your, yourselves and what you have done. Now he makes application that we can have in our lives in verse 3. Clearly, you are an epistle of now, verse 2, he was talking about they were an epistle for Paul. But verse 3, he says, clearly, you are an epistle of who? You are an epistle of Christ. 
interesting how many different metaphors God uses for being a Christian. You are the light of the world. And we have a certain image about being a Christian and what it is that we are the light of the world. Up in chapter 2, what did we see? We are the fragrance. We are the fragrance of Christ in this world. That's a, that's a metaphor used about what a Christian is to be and should be. Now you get to chapter 3, we've got a whole other metaphor. As Christians, we are epistles. We are letters of Christ. Well, who's reading us? The end of, the end of verse 2, who's reading us? Everybody. You're like an open book. And people are judging Christianity and they're judging Christ based upon you. We say sometimes don't judge a book by its cover. Guess what? In some ways, we are the cover. If we are the earthen vessels in which the gospel has been put in order that we can share it with others, people are reading us. How interested are people in Christianity when they read you? Uh, friend? Yeah. The, the, you, Fran says that, you know, people that haven't been to church and, and haven't read the Bible, you may be the only Bible that they read. Sometimes it said you may be the only sermon that somebody else will ever hear. Just by your life. When people read you, what do they think of Christianity? What do they think about Christ? You are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us. But notice he says, you're not written with ink. It's not that you have a piece of papyrus in which you have placed some ink upon it, but you're written by the Spirit of the living God. You haven't been written on tablets of stone. And it's interesting he mentions this here. Because as we've said about this letter, Paul, Paul kind of jumps from topic to topic and then he'll jump back to another topic. He says something and it makes him think of something else. You're not written on tablets of stone. What was written on tablets of stone? Ten Commandments. You're not written on tablets of stone. He's going to get to the Ten Commandments in about three verses. You're not written on tablets of stone, but on tablets of the flesh, that is, of the heart. It's interesting because God said... Jeremiah 31, that he was going to make a new covenant. And it wouldn't be according to the old covenant. And that his covenant was going to be written where? It's going to be written on the hearts. Paul says, you've been written, you are an epistle. And as this epistle, you, you are an epistle of Christ. But we're not talking about something that's physical and is read like a, a physical letter with paper and ink. But it's been written on the heart. We looked in uh, uh, verses, five, uh, verses 5 and 6 just a moment ago. Come down to verse 6 where he talked about that God had made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. And when you start in verse 6, and you can pretty much go through the rest of this chapter... You start in verse 6, and you go through the rest of the chapter, and you have in this chapter one of the greatest contrasts drawn anywhere in the New Testament between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. If you ever get into discussion with someone about the difference between the Old Law and the New Law, between the Law of Moses and the Law of Christ, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is a good place to go. There's a lot of good places. Galatians chapter 3, verses 19 through 25, what then is the purpose of the law? You go through the rest of that chapter, that's a great place to go. But he draws at least seven different contrasts between the Old Testament and the New Testament just in this part of chapter 3. And uh, he calls it here in verse 6, he calls it the New Covenant. Well, if you have a new covenant, what does that imply? That you've got an old one. And that's the argument that uh, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 13 makes. That if you've got, a, if you've got an old one, if you've got a new one, that implies you've got one of the... So look in, chap, look in verse 14. And we're, we're going to kind of jump around in this section. And, and I, I want you to see these seven contrasts that he makes. 
Verse 6 talks about the new covenant. Verse 14 talks about the reading of the what? The Old Testament. So you have the word new in this passage. You have the word old. So you've got the contrast between the new and the old. Which one is superior? The new. You read the book of Hebrews. You read the book of Hebrews. And, and who is superior, Christ or Moses? You read the book of Hebrews and, and who is superior, the law of Christ or the law of Moses? The law of Christ and everything it has to offer. And so we, we look here and we see that we have a new covenant. But look at, look at verse 6 again. This new covenant is not of the letter, but of the Spirit. And we could spend a lot of time there and we're not going to do that. It's not of the letter, but of the Spirit. You might write next to the word letter there that he's, talk, he's using that metaphor to talk about the law. Here's the new covenant. It is not according to the law, the letter, the actual Old, doc, Old Testament document. Remember, the New Testament had not even been completed yet. The new covenant, it's not according to that letter to the law, but it's according to the Spirit. Now, do you have a capital S or a lowercase s on your word spirit there? Capital? Anybody got a lowercase? Old King James has lowercase. Which one's right? Capital S or lowercase s? Let's just read through the chapter, see if we can make sense of it. But here's this new covenant. It is, uh, the, the, the letter, the law of the Old Testament was something that was, um, it was a law that was imposed from without. It was written on those tablets of stone, it was imposed from without. But the Spirit, and this verse says that the Spirit gives life. The law of Jesus, is that imposed from without or is that imposed from within? When Jesus talked about the, the, uh, the new covenant, it was something that would be written on the heart. Here's a law that, that's, not, that's not given to us and laid upon us from without, but it's a law that's right, written on our hearts, which should permeate and, uh, and dictate how we live. For, verse six, six, uh, verse 6 says, For the letter, what does the letter do? The letter kills. But the Spirit, the new covenant, the New Testament, it gives life. What does it mean by the letter, the Old Testament, the law? What does it mean that it kills? It condemns? Look at verse 7. Notice that this letter that kills, what is it called at the beginning of verse 7? It is called the ministry of death. Look down in verse uh, number 9. In verse number 9, it's called the ministry of what? Condemnation. Here is the Old Testament. What is the Old Testament? The Old Testament kills. It is the ministry of death. It is the ministry of condemnation. What in the world is that talking about? Was the, was the Old Testament from God? Yeah. Was the law of Moses, was it given by God? Yes. And why would it be called a ministry of death? How many, how many sins could be pardoned? under the Old Testament. When they offered the blood of bulls and goats, Hebrews chapter 10, could the blood of bulls and goats take away sin? No. So you have the Old Testament, a, a, a law, a letter that kills. It was an Old Testament that brought the knowledge of sin. It brought the guilt of sin. But the Old Testament did not bring about the pardon of sin. Where, where does the pardon of sin come in? In Christ. And so it is this new covenant, and perhaps the S in, chapter, in verse 6 
Perhaps it should be a lowercase. Uppercase is okay. But here is this new covenant. It's given by the Spirit, and so maybe that's a reason to capitalize it. Here's the new covenant. It gives life. For the ministry of death, verse 7, the Old Testament is written and engraved on stones. I want you to think about the Judaizer, and I don't know if we've called them that yet. I want you to think about these Judaizing teachers that were in Corinth. These false teachers, we sometimes call them Judaizing teachers, because they had come in and they were trying to impose Judaism. They were coming into the church and trying to impose the keeping of the Jewish law. And so if you were one who was trying to impose the keeping of the Jewish law, Paul just called it the ministry of death. Well, that's not very positive, but that's the reality. Because it was engraved on stones. But look at what he says in verse 7. Was the Old Testament glorious? Verse 7, ministry of death, written engraved on stones. Was the Old Testament glorious? Absolutely. Absolutely. Who gave it? Well, God gave it. It's absolutely glorious. It was so glorious, verse 7, that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face. In Exodus chapter 34, when Moses was up on the mountain talking to God, when he came down off of the mountain... Had anything changed about Moses? His face. What was different about his face? It was shining so brightly that the people would not look at him. Why was his face shining so brightly? He had been in the presence of God. What had God given to Moses when he was up on that mountain? The old law. When Moses came down with that old law, was it glorious? The very face of Moses was symbolic of the fact that it was glorious. But notice what the end of verse 7 says. It was glorious, just like the face of Moses was glorious when it came down off of the mountain. But what does it say about that glory at the end of verse 7? Fading. It's passing away. Look down in verse uh, number 11. For if what is passing away. Look down in verse 13. What's the last two words you have of verse 13? If you've got a new King James. There's something that is passing away. Look at the end of verse 14. What are the last four or five words you have in verse 14? Not just passing away, but it's do, it, what's happening to this law. It's taken away in Christ. So Paul is illustrating, he's, he's contrasting the two covenants, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And he says this old covenant, this Old Testament, it was glorious, just like the face of Moses. But it's passing away. Did Moses' face, did it stay bright and shining and glorious forever? No. What happened? It faded. Symbolically of the covenant, the old covenant eventually fading, the face of Moses eventually would fade away. Look at verse 8. He calls the ministry of the Spirit more glorious. The Old Testament, it was glorious. It was from God. Of course it would be glorious. But the New Testament, verse 8, was more glorious. Verse 9, for if the ministry of condemnation had glory, which it did... Look at how he contrasts it. New Testament's not the ministry of condemnation, it's the ministry of righteousness. It exceeds, surpasses much more in glory. Verse 10, for even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. Think about this contrast. When we look up in the night sky, are the stars, do they, are they glorious? Do they have a glory and a shine to them? What about the moon? Obviously the moon is reflecting the sun, but is the moon, does it, is it glorious? You look at it on, on a full moon night, 
and it is bright, glorious. How long can you stand there and stare at the moon? You do it for a while? If you get a telescope out and, and zoom in on the moon and its brightness, how long can you look at it? Pretty good while, right? Stars, you can get your telescope out. Boy, you can, you can scout those out and you can plot them and you can look at them. The next day, the sun comes up. What happened to the stars? Are they gone? Hello, I was just seeing the stars. Do they like take a nap during the day? Are, are they just nocturnal beings, you know, and they just come out at night? What happened to the stars? There's something that's glory far surpasses that of the, sun, uh, of the stars and the moon that they cannot coexist, at least in our sight. You get your telescope out, you zoom in on the sun, how long can you look at it? Well, until your cornea burns out, right? I mean, you're doing pretty good. You can't do it. Why? Because it's so much. That's the contrast he's drawing. Is the Old Testament glorious? Yes. But when you hold the New Testament up to it, no comparison. It exceeds it in glory. Verse 11. That was just first bell, right? Good, i got about 15 minutes. For if, verse 11, for if what is passing away was glorious, what remains, and there's the contrast, the Old Testament's passing away, but what remains is much more glorious. There is that which is passing away, but the word remains here in the present tense indicates there's that which is going to continue. Something has passed away, the Old Testament. Here's the New Testament. It is here, and it remains, and it will continue to remain. Therefore, verse 12, since we have such hope, this hope of righteousness from this new covenant, we use great boldness of speech. We're not ashamed of the gospel. However, that wasn't like Moses. Moses didn't have that same boldness. Unlike Moses, verse 13, who put on a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily, I like this phrase, at the end of what was passing away. When Moses came down off of the mountain and his face was shining brightly and the people wouldn't look at him, what did he do to, uh, to get the people to pay attention to him? He put a veil over his face. When, they, when he put the veil on, they could not see the end of what was passing away. And, and that, that phrase could have a couple meanings. One, if he's got the veil over his face, could they tell when the, when the bright and shining and glory had faded away? They, he's just got a veil on. They may not see the fading of it away because of the veil. But he's got a veil on. Notice how many times you got the word veil in this passage. He's got a veil over his face. Verse 14. But their minds were what? Blinded. They were hardened. For until this very day, the same veil remains. In the Old Testament, they could not see the glory of that covenant. They could not see the glory of Moses' face because he put a veil on. Paul says, you know what, that's still here today. Not the physical veil. But he says, that's still here today. There are some who cannot see the glory of the covenant of God because there's a veil in the way. Well, where'd that veil come from? Verse 14 says, to this very day that same veil remains and it remains unlifted when, when the Old Testament is read because they do not have a clue that this veil was taken away in Christ. When Jesus died upon the cross, what happened to the Old Testament? It was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2.14. Galatians 3, 24 and 25 say we are no longer under that covenant. And what he says here, and, and, and I know we're, out of, we're going to be out of time. Got one minute. The veil was something that they had put on, not physically, but in order that they would not see the glory of God and of His covenant, they had put a veil on, and they, 
they could not and would not, perhaps is better said, they would not listen to the fact that the old covenant was taken away in Christ. So they're still trying to teach people to do it. Verse 15, but even to this day when Moses is publicly read, the law of Moses is publicly read, a veil lies on their heart. Well, who put it there? They did. They put it there. Nevertheless, when somebody turns to the Lord, what happens to that veil in verse 16? It's taken away. Why? Because they have realized that old covenant is taken away. I am going to turn to the Lord and to obey Him. Let me get to verse 17 and then we're going to quit. Now the Lord, Jesus, is the what? Spirit. Capital S or lowercase s? Back in verse 6, the new covenant was called the Spirit. In verse 17, Jesus is called the Spirit. Is this talking about the Holy Spirit? Or is this saying that Jesus is? He's the mediator, the one who has brought this new covenant. The Lord is the Spirit, and when He has come, the law, the, the, the ministry of death has been taken away, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, where the new covenant is, of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty. There's freedom, the end of verse 17. Freedom from the old law. Freedom from that veil that they had covered their eyes with. Freedom from sin. But all of that's in the Lord. All of that's in the new covenant. And if we don't turn to that new covenant, he says, if we're still trying to bind the old law like the Judaizers are, he says, that law is going to lead us to death. This is one of the greatest sections in the New Testament to contrast the old law and the new law. Let me make this one last comment. I know we've got to stop. Seventh day Adventists want you to believe that there is a difference in the Old Testament between the Ten Commandments and what they call the ceremonial law. The rest of the Old Testament and the Ten Commandments. They want you to they want you to believe there's a difference. They want you to believe that when Jesus died upon the cross that He took away the ceremonial law. All the other part of the Old Testament, Jesus took that away, but that the Ten Commandments was never taken away. The Ten Commandments was never abolished, but only that ceremonial part. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 demolishes that argument. Because when He's talking about the old law, He calls it the ministry of death, the ministry of reconciliation. He calls it the letter that kills. But where does he say that covenant was written? Verse 3 and verse 7. Where was that covenant written? On stones. What part of the old covenant was written on stones? Well, the Ten Commandments. Not the rest of it. 2 Corinthians 3 brings it all together and says every bit of it, Ten Commandments included, were taken away in Christ. I know that's a lot of extra. And I went over time. But thank you for your good attention this morning.